we are concerned with the many things we see going on in our country at this time, but Lord, it's still a great country. And may we be, continue to be proud of it and continue to have be a, a great patriot of this country. And tomorrow, as we remember the, the birth of our country so many years ago back in 1776, that we will um, honor it and not just look at it as a day off from work or time to shoot off fireworks, but Lord, to remember um, the freedom we have, to remember all those who sacrificed their uh, blood for it clear back in the Revolutionary War up and not clear up until the present time. We pray for all this, the wars going on, especially in Ukraine, and Lord, help in that situation. The wars going on in the cities, all the shootings going on, things like in Chicago right now, Lord, have your hand upon our country. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's turn to one that's not patriotic. Let's turn to number 678. No, excuse me, 486. 486, true-hearted, whole-hearted. 486. tonight. Did you hear the sound? That's the sound of God's blessing. God sends rain on the just and on the unjust, and we need rain. So thank the Lord for rain. May we have more of it this week. Even if it is Independence Day tomorrow at the ranch, we'll take the rain. We will take the rain. Well, wanted to get a quick report from Brother Koning. We're praying for Mrs. Koning. She's home from the hospital. How is she doing, Brother Koning? Amen. So glad she's home. Thank the Lord. 
and their daughter Becky is there at the house and she's um, with mom tonight and making sure mom's taken care of so the brother Casper can come to church this evening and um, did you notice he's wearing patriotic colors you didn't notice that did you I just I like his, his bright red coat and his I was thinking around the room just a few minutes ago as we were singing patriotic music and here we sit in comfort and ease and I was just imagining that we have folks in our church building, even tonight, who have lived for a good time in Nigeria, in Russia. Some of you have been overseas in the military all over. We have people who've been in Vietnam serving our country. We have the Konings who were up in, well, they, of course, he's from Netherlands, grew up in Netherlands, and then took care of downed RAF pilots in World War II, his dad did. And Brother Koning and his wife up in Canada for a while. And um, just thinking about all those around the room, we have people who've been in the Caribbean and all around the world. And if you've traveled at all in America or around the world, especially, you should be thankful for what we have. Amen. You should be thankful for America and thankful to, to be here tonight. In just a few minutes, we'll have our young people sing right before the service. And um, just mention very briefly, it is so good to have Miss Joan with us. And uh, she's a friend of the Bruce's and Dr. and Mrs. Bruce. We miss Dr. Bruce. And he's, he's with the Lord. He's doing wonderful. And Mrs. Bruce is still here and just struggles from day to day. And, uh, but Mrs. Joan is just a good friend of the Bruce's and served as the secretary there at the ministry for years. Isn't that right? So she served as the secretary and her husband went home to heaven nine months ago. And uh, she's always welcome here. And we're thankful you came. Really are. Well, after the service tonight, we are celebrating two big important things. And one is my oldest daughter's graduation from high school, Cassia. And we would love for you to join us for just some light refreshments afterward. And then also for the great day, the 80th birthday of Brother Ted Searcy. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so he is 80 years old as of last week. And we want to celebrate both with one fell swoop. And we'll ask you to join with us tonight for that after the service. Song that seems appropriate for the age we live in. What's the number 357? In times like these. In times like these, we need to sing.
90, 9 zero. Love hearing the young people sing, but I hope they sing more and more as we continue on. Psalm 90 is a psalm of Moses, the prophet of God on Mount Horeb. The first 12 chapters of Psalm 90 really have to do with his meditations about God, his contemplations about God. And from verse 12 on are really his requests of God. It's the passage I've chosen tonight to use with my oldest daughter going away to college soon and with her on 18 years old, right? 18 years old, I had to ask. <laughs> Usually Rebecca has all the dates and the birthdays and all these things and I turn to her for help. And then also I believe Psalm 90 very well covers age 80 with Brother Searcy. And I want to make much tonight of how God is our dwelling place in all generations. Psalm 90, Psalm 90, verse number 1. Again, the first 12 verses really have to do with a meditation 
of, of God. Let's read through. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood, they are as asleep. In the morning they're like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath we're troubled. I want to pause for a moment and ask you, what would Moses know about people being cut down about the wrath of God, what would Moses know about that? Where would he get this whole thinking that we're consumed by thine anger and by thy wrath we're troubled? Where would he get that? Forty years in the wilderness, watching an entire generation pass off the scene. Himself not entering the promised land. For thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. Look at verses 9 and 10. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. You say, Pastor, you picked a humdinger of a passage tonight. Who knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. There's a point to saying all that, you know. Here's, God, here's Moses' request. So teach us. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. And I love verse 14. O oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we've seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. Back to verse 1. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. I guess when you're traveling through the wilderness and every house you've ever had had a, had a, had a rag door. Every home you've ever had had a flap. Every wall had a rope tied to it and a peg at the end. It makes you say, we really are pilgrims. And really, thou art our dwelling place. And I love it that I can talk on a Sunday night to a people of God and I can look at an 80-year-old man and I can look at an 18-year-old young lady and I can say, God will be faithful to you at age 18 as he will be faithful to be your dwelling place at age 80. Yes. You say, what do you mean he's our dwelling place? Well, we are wonderfully blessed even to have a Savior who said, I go to prepare a place for you. So he's our dwelling place now, but he's prepared a place for us later, and we're going to be with him, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. As you look down through some of the verses, it's uh, verse 6. It says that in the morning the grass, it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it's cut down and withereth. So... I like this. One man, Spurgeon, said, this is the history of grass. Sown, 
grown, blown, moan, gone. <laughs> and he said, and the history of man isn't much more. Life is short. Life is so short. The only thing worth doing is serving God. The only dwelling place worth having is the Lord. And it, you look at this passage, and Israel suffered for their sin. Verse 7 and 8, were consumed by thine anger and by thy wrath were troubled because of their unbelief, because of their rebellion and disobedience and hardness of heart, they were forced to wander 40 years. And did you know a holy God is angered at sin? He's angered at sin. And whether you're young or old, our sins find us out. Moses looks back and he just says, verse number 8, Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. It means that our sins have uncanny ways of just coming to the surface. So God's totally aware of them. Our ears are short as a tale that's told. There's a couple times in this passage it says that our sins are as a, our life is as a tale that's told. Tale, that's the word. It's like, this is the word. In, in Hebrew, it's the word for to sigh or to moan. Let's, I'd like you all to give a good sigh tonight. Could you give a good sigh? Let's just all, on, on three, go, ah. I felt good. All right, let's do it. Ready? One, two, three. Ah. Kind of seems like something you do at the end of a hard day, doesn't it? Sounds like a job. Either you're looking ahead of you at a lot to do, or you're looking behind you at your lot done, and you, oh. And the Word of God says that life is wearisome and has toils and trials, and the life of man is as a sigh before God. And Psalm 90 is just straight talk from Moses. He says in verse number 12, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Moses' prayer was, Lord God, would you impress upon your people how short life is? Would you show us? It's easier to convince an 80-year-old than an 18-year-old. Life is short. Life is just, it's just a vapor. And he's trying to impress upon and asking God, would you teach us, plural, not just me, but teach me, teach the people of Israel to number our days so that we won't spend our days in the wilderness, so that we'll apply our hearts to wisdom. Let's live for God now. Let's serve him. Let's have eternal values in, in view. And he... He says, verse 14, O oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Yes. Satisfy us early with thy mercy. And you see that there's a great deal of gladness at the end of this passage. We want to be glad all our days in the Lord. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we've seen evil. I love verse 17, let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. This is the common word for kindness, pleasantness, delightfulness. It's the word noam. I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but, but I'm told that Hebrew young ladies are still named noam. Beauty. Let the beauty of the Lord be upon us. The noam. And I want to take a few minutes tonight and challenge us all, no matter our age, that we might ask God to teach us to number our days, that we might apply our hearts unto wisdom. Satisfy us early, Lord, with thy mercy. There's so much that you want to get in in, a, in the years that you have for training your children and you just don't get it all in and you look back and you think of all the things that you missed and all the things that you wish you'd taught and you say, Lord, I need, we need great grace. You're the best teacher. 
Would you teach where I failed to? Would you help in the lessons that I, I didn't get across? And I wanted to start with the testimony of three men who early they learned God's lesson of mercy. Job chapter 29, verse 1. Job chapter 29, verse 1. Maybe not a normal passage you'd see or think of or turn to, but Job chapter 29, verse 1. And I want to challenge us, each and every one, to have a personal relationship with God early, early on. Job 29, verse 1. Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, Oh, that I were in months past, as in the days when God preserved me, when his candle shined upon my head, and when by the light I walked through darkness, as I was in the days of my youth, when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were about me. And so Job looks back and he says, I can remember when I was in darkness, but the candle of God shined on my head. In the dark, now, we don't use candles very much. Um, we have candles at our house. How many of you have candles at your house? Okay, so we still have candles. So what do you save them for? You save them for when the power goes out, when the electricity goes out. And candles were used, of course, when, this, when it's dark. And Job's looking at, at a dark time in his own life and saying, I remember when I was young, when in the days of my youth, the secret of my God was upon my tabernacle. When I walked in the darkness by God's light. And what he's saying is twofold. He's saying, I'm in the dark now, but I, don't, I can't seem to see the light of God at all from this particular viewpoint. Now, we have the larger story of Job in chapters 1 and 2 in the last chapters. What I want you to see is Job was an upright man who eschewed evil, a perfect man in his days. And one of the things we find out about Job is that from his youth, from his youth, the secret of God was upon his tabernacle. God was his dwelling place in all generations. Take Job. You've already seen a passage over in Psalms. Will you turn to chapter Psalm, verse 71, verse 3? Perhaps David. Psalm 71, verse 3. Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. It's Psalm 71, verse 3. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and the cruel man. For thou art my hope, O Lord God. Here we are in verse 5. Thou art my trust from my youth. So the psalmist says, I've been, my trust has been in you from the time I was young. So in his aged years, he declares the wonderful works of God and the trustworthiness of God. I bring to you Job, I bring to you David, I bring to you the preacher. Ecclesiastes 12. Ecclesiastes 12. You'll remember this, no doubt. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Look at verse 9, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 9. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. He gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads. What do you do with a goad? You goad something. That wasn't much help. You poke, you prod, you get it moving. You, you, you help direct. 
with a pointed object. And the words of the wise are words that sometimes are pricking and poking and jabbing and hurting. And sometimes things are said by the preacher in Ecclesiastes or by other books of the Bible that are sharp words. And they are to help us. And he goes on and says, verse 11, the words of the wise are as goats and as nails fastened by the masters of the assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further by these, my son, be admonished. Now I've decided to leave off the last half of the verse since the daughter's going to college. No, it says, of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness to the flesh. Um, that is part of the passage. I want to take, again, your attention tonight to some very important lessons. And one is, let's get wisdom early. Let's get wisdom early. From my daughter's perspective, I want to challenge her and all of our young people here today that there is a time... There's a time when of preparation for usefulness for God. And that's what you've been in all these years. All these years have been preparing you for the runway to take off and to be on your own. And when your first few years, you're spoon-fed. Everything is given to you. And it's high time to hear from, from God for yourself. To hear from God with your Bible and your notebook and to learn and take what God take, teaches you and you make it yours. You are responsible. God will hold you accountable. I could take a brand new baby and put a baby on one side over here and a mama holding a little baby and I could take a 10-year-old boy and put her over here, a 10-year-old girl, and I could say, and you would probably agree with me, there's a world of difference between a baby that cannot do anything for themselves and a 10-year-old. Then I could take a 10-year-old and move the 10-year-old over to this side and add 10 more years and put a 20-year-old over here. And I could tell you there's a world of difference between a 10-year-old and a 20-year-old. A lot can change in 10 years. And between the ages of, well, when you're first born up to 18, there's a lot of changes. And there's a time to prepare and lay a foundation. And I want... You don't understand that someday you're going to turn around and look at your life. You don't want to behave in such a way without wisdom that you look back and it's a mess that can't be undone. Did you know there's things that can't be undone? And a lot of, a lot of foolishness can be accomplished in a very short amount of time. A lot of foolishness can fit in a very short window. And a lifetime of wisdom can be set aside. And so you hear from Proverbs and you hear from Ecclesiastes, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Develop the personal relationship with God. Be like Job who says, from my youth, the light of God was upon me. From my youth, David sought God in his youth. Trusted him from the time of his youth. Proverbs chapter 4. Will you go there? Proverbs 4. Verse 1. Proverbs 4 verse 1. Hear ye children the instruction of a father and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law. Verse 3, for I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not and she shall preserve thee. Love her and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom. With all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor. And when thou dost embrace her, she shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory. Shall she deliver to thee? Hear, O my son, verse 10 says, and receive my sayings. And the years of thy life shall be many. 
I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. When thou goest, thy step shall not be straightened. And when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. You never regret gaining wisdom or taking time to gain wisdom. Can I ask? Um, I'm not going to ask. Many of you went to college and you sharpened your axe so that you could go further into the woods. Some of you, maybe that wasn't the path God had for you. Maybe God, maybe some of you went to college and you ended up going into a totally different field than what you trained for. That's okay too, isn't it? But wisdom is valuable no matter where you go. Get wisdom early. Occupy your time with the pursuit of wisdom. It's found in a book. If someone shares their, and I say this because we're in a world of sharing. Everyone wants to share. Everyone wants to tweet and twit. Everyone wants to share their wisdom. And I would tell you, if someone shares their experience and it's contrary to the teachings of the Word of God, their wisdom is not wisdom. It's foolishness. It's of no value at all. And just because someone even who says something has gray hair does not make it wisdom. Don't uncheck your brain. Don't turn it off. Live in the Proverbs. Listen. I want to challenge you to get, get wisdom for your family's sake. For your family's sake. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 1 says, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Proverbs 17, verse 21 says, He that begetteth a fool doeth it to his sorrow, and the father of a fool hath no joy. Proverbs 17, 25 a foolish son is a grief to his father and a bitterness to her that bear him. Proverbs 23, verses 24 and 25. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. I want to challenge you. Get wisdom. Get wisdom. Cassie is looking at Indiana Baptist College. So that's up on the south side of Indianapolis. We've been there. We've checked it out. We've seen it. And I want you to know that you can go to good colleges, even good Bible colleges, and people can teach things wrong. But in a place like that, we believe as best we know that it's a place that will teach you right. But we want to challenge you to get wisdom from God. I can tell you, Cassia, that I had, I, I look back at my college years and I loved them. I sat under some of, I think, Pensacola's best teachers of the day. I'm a little prejudiced that the teachers back then were better than the teachers now. But that's because Dr. Johnson was there then too. And Harry Nonamaker. And my folks will remember a lot of the names, Dr. Kendall. And he's in heaven with the Lord now. And I was talking to Brother Bickish about his college experience. And he was telling me about some of the teachers he appreciated and some more than others. And I completely understand that. I had the same experience. But I want my daughter to hear from God. I wanted to distinguish right from wrong. Not to take it because someone says it. Can you imagine coming from a church called Berean Baptist where everything that is told to you, you're supposed to be more noble because you search the scriptures to see whether those things are true, and then you go off to college and assume that everything's true. Remember where you came from. Get wisdom. Next, be about your father's business. Be about your father's business. 
I could take you to Luke 2, verse 49 today, but you know the verse where Jesus said he must be about his father's business. Don't be a spectator. Get involved. Serve. Serve. Did you know that when the Bible says, so teach us to number our days, that we may, might apply our hearts unto wisdom, can I just tell you this? And I'm not talking to Cassie. I'm talking to everyone out there. I'm telling you, there are absolutely no, and I mean this, no spiritual rewards in the judgment day for playing video games. Hey. There's none. Hey. You say, you have a thing against video games. No, not really. I have a thing about, so teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts unto wisdom. Right. <laughs> trophies, most trophies burn. The average young person is addicted to pleasure. But I want to remind you, that's not why God made you. Do you know why God made you? God made you for himself. Amen. That you might bring glory and honor and praise to him and his son. God made you so that you might apply your heart unto wisdom. And, not, and so that you might redeem this precious entity which he's put in your hands you have no more than anyone else and no less than anyone else in a 24-hour day it's redeem the time why though we might apply our hearts unto wisdom years ago i sat in the white house town council meeting right here in town and there was one man he's still the city administrator and i think he's doing a good job but the city administrator was the one out of, I think, six men who kept White House from making, well, from having as its, uh, um, an American idol as its namesake. Clark Beckham is from White House. And the city administrator said something to the effect of, I don't know that we want to take someone who is part of the entertainment industry and make that what White House is known for. Oh, oh. And his statement turned the whole room. Amen. I remember sitting there just as a pastor in White House saying, you're right. I want to enjoy life, but that's not what life's about. And the men in the town council, I could tell you some of the churches they go to, they're Baptist churches. And when they heard that, that resonated with them. And they agreed, that's not what life is about. And some of them spoke of the Lord right there in that council meeting, very openly. And I, said, I thought, thank God for some men in a town council in White House who understand the purpose of life is not just about entertainment. This is, let's be about our Father's business. This passage in Ecclesiastes, in the verses before, right before chapter 12, I love the end of chapter 11. It basically says more or less, enjoy life, but understand God's going to bring you into judgment. Enjoy life. Enjoy it to the full. One part in Ecclesiastes talks about wearing um, white robes and perfume. And what it means is step out. Enjoy life with the wife of your youth. Put on your fancy duds. Scrub up. Go out and enjoy life. But understand that there's more to life than that too. There's, let's be about our father's business. And this, I want to turn a little bit and point you back when it says, so teach us to number our days, that might apply our hearts to wisdom. I'd like to, last of all, challenge all in the room, especially our youth, to look to those who are older than you spiritually and glean. Look to those who are older than you spiritually and glean. What do you mean? I mean, I, don't, I want to challenge Cassie. I want to challenge all those in the room to value our senior saints. 
Now, Proverbs 23, 22 isn't exactly talking about that, but it is. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is, when she's old. James 1, 27 says that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Proverbs 20 talks about the beauty of old age and says the glory of young men is their strength and the beauty of old age is the gray head. Amen. <laughs> Do you know that your life is going to bring praise or shame to your grandparents? It'll bring praise or shame to them. Proverbs 17, 6, children's children are the crown of old men. Children's children. What it means when it says it's the crown of old men, it means elevate your granddad to a place of royalty. Elevate your grandparents. Seek their wisdom. Seek their counsel. We have... I'm staggered when I look around the room and I see the wisdom that God's given us in this room from pastors and assistant pastors and people who've been in ministry. We have, we have hundreds of years compiled worth of ministry represented in the room and wisdom that is so deep. And I look at the young men and the young ladies in our room and I say, there's so much wisdom to be had if you would just ask the right questions. You know, a person, a person who's wise will draw water out of the well. Go to the well and draw it out. This is, you're, what, you're missing something if you're not seeking the wisdom in the room from folks. It's, it's curious in this passage, isn't it? When it says in, verse, in Psalm 90, verse 10, it says the days of our years are threescore years and ten. Did you know that it didn't always used to be that? Did you know that the, there was a time when the years of the humanity used to be typically over 700? Why did God cut off people's lives short to age 70? Could he not trust them past that? Did they spend so much time in wickedness? Did people use their lives, their longer lives, any way they wanted to? Well, how many ever years God has given us? Let me just give us, in closing, some quick thoughts, all just kind of shotgun style, that I want to put before you. Find something every day to praise God for. Find something every day. Psalm 148, both young men and maidens, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is excellent, his glory is above the earth and heaven. You see how it says young men, maidens, old men and children, praise the name of the Lord. Number two, show God's strength to the generation that follows. Psalm 71, 18, Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to every one that is to come. This is, this is basically the Titus 2 woman, the older teaching younger. It's the older man, the aged man teaching the younger. Cassie, it's, it's an 18-year-old young lady taking on a younger lady than her. Do you remember, and I, I, don't, I don't want to point people out too much, but I think many of you remember. Remember the James girls when Rebecca and Katie and Heidi, and I don't, and remember the name of the young lady that they worked with for all those years. Remember her name? Paula. Paula. And Paula might have been a little slow. Paula was part of our bus ministry. And sometimes I would wonder whether God brought the James girls there for Paula, or Paula there for the James girls? Because all three of the James girls worked for periods of their life discipling this young girl who hadn't much of a chance when it came to a family. And I'm telling you, it was older, adopting, younger. 
That can happen on college campuses. Because on college campuses, there are people that go to college and they have been saved for the last 15, no, 13 years. And there's some who walk on a college campus and they got saved last year. And there are people in churches like that and there's people in bus ministries like that. They just adopt someone. They take them under wing. They help them. It is... It's that Titus 2, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity and patience. What is it? It's showing to the next generation the strength of the Lord. It is, it is teaching. It's the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. There is a place in this church for every old man and old woman that God has brought and they ought to be teachers of good things. And if it does not happen in the local church, the Bible says that the word of God be not blasphemed. Watch the older people. Watch them go through difficult times. The veil gets kind of thin between the visible and the invisible as a person gets older. And you, it's, it's like Elisha when Elisha had a servant. And Elisha was a little older, and the servant was a younger man. And the younger man couldn't see as clearly the things of God around, but the older man, Elisha, could see it. And he said to the younger man, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Don't be so captivated by what you see that you forget what you can't see. Let God be your dwelling place in all generations. The fact is, most of what you see around you is kindling. There's a whole creation that you cannot see. And last point is, God will never forsake you. God will never forsake you. I can't even look at my wife and say, I'll always be with you. Because... I probably will go to the grocery store this week. <laughs> I'm going to probably go one direction when we can come back. But God never leaves. God never forsakes. And the psalmist says, Psalm 37, 25, I have been young and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor is he begging bread. And God will not forsake the young person going off to Bible college. And God will not forsake the 80-year-old man and his wife who continued to seek him steadfastly. He's not going to forsake him. He's not going to. Psalm 71, 9, Cast me not off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth. I'm telling you, I've seen God take care of folks who are older who spent their life serving God. It is the best insurance policy. Live uprightly. Walk with God. You can lean on His promises. You might worry, am I going to have enough? Times are getting rough in America. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. You know what? This is, God will take care of His people. You do not have to worry about that. You look to the Lord. God will take care of you. I was, Mr. Ro, Mr. Um, Bird came in the office tonight and he asked a question. He said, where did you get the name Papa? Did that come from your folks or your, your parents? Or where did you get Papa? Your, your children call you Papa. And I said, um, no, we didn't really get it from our folks. It was just something we picked up. And some friends of ours, their children called them Papa. And we said, you know what? We like that. 
And, and um, it's grandma and grandpa Lang. We're in the south. We, we, don't, we haven't got around to the pawpaw and the peepaw and the everything else. I don't even know what all they do in the south. But it's grandma and grandpa. But, the, but the, what I want you to, to hear is God will take care of you. God's going to take care of you in an unsettled economy, even if you have more than enough or you don't. God can take care. Faith is not a bank account. And the same God that took care of you when you had little children will take care of you when you have grandchildren. God hasn't gone anywhere. And he will be your dwelling place in all generations Psalm 84 is one of my favorite passages on the loving kindness and the caring aspect of God. Psalm 84. It says in Psalm 84, verse 3, Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Two types of birds mentioned here. I bring this up because my girls, are, uh, my girls have enjoyed bird watching and taking pictures of birds. And I want to give my daughter a picture of two birds before she goes off to college. The sparrow and the swallow. The sparrow is known for being the most worthless of all birds. It doesn't even have a good song. But... The Bible says in Matthew 10 are not two sparrows sold for one farthing. So you'd think if one farthing would buy two sparrows, then two, spa two farthings would buy four. No, Luke 12 says are not five sparrows sold for two farthings. You get an extra one free. That's how cheap they are. Dr. James Brooks of St. Louis used to say, I think that's how I got saved. God was saving four others and threw me in. <laughs> the utter worthlessness of a sparrow, and yet this is the one that not a sparrow falls to the ground, but God sees. And God said, did you notice the sparrow takes up residence in my altars, in the house of God. I'll come back to that in a moment. But God does say you and I are more value than many sparrows. The swallow, what's that known for? Well, maybe you think of a barn swallow. Well, a swallow is known for being one of the most restless of all birds. You see that over in Proverbs 26 too, as the bird by wandering as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. That verse is an encouragement maybe to folks who are concerned about someone who says, let's say that we had something happen and someone says, I'm going to cast a curse on you. You don't have to worry about that. The cursed causeless shall not come. It won't come. You don't have to worry about that. Safe am I in the hollow of his hand. The passage is saying that a swallow may go here and there restlessly back and forth, but that's not the way God's blessing is, and that's not the way cursing is. There's purpose. The swallow, the most restless of birds, always on the wing, constantly flying in and out. And yet he says, did you notice they have a little house there in my altars? The most worthless, the most restless can take up residence there. Why? I ask myself, why altars, plural? Well, there were two primary altars. One was the great brazen altar. It's where the sacrifice was slain. It was a bloody altar. Blood poured out. Bodies were burned on the sacrifice. The, and the, it was the picture of the cross where the sinner found refuge in the cross of Christ, in the blood of Christ. And Christ did die for our sins, and we find refuge at the cross. The other altar was the golden altar of incense. 
It was an altar of sweet, fragrant incense that's, that rose up to God in heaven continually. And Psalm 141, verse 2 says, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and as the lifting up of my hands at the evening sacrifice. And so it's almost like it's the intercession, like lifting up of the hands at the evening sacrifice. It's like it's intercession. And you find that we have a, we have a place in the heart of God in the intercessory work of Christ. And what I want you to see, last of all, is that God is caring for sparrows and swallows. The most worthless, the most restless, they find a house, a home in the altars of God. And for some reason, God wanted us to know that. And you're of more value than many sparrows, and God's going to take care of you. I look around the room, and I see some who are widowed or widowers. I see some who are young and maybe have struggles. I see some who are going through tar hard times, and I think of Mr. Ballinger with his, his struggles in the past with his heart, and I think of people who have vertigo, and I think around the room, and of Mrs. Coning, and I, I'm so glad that God takes care of his people. And a, and a pastor can get up on a Sunday night, look at his daughter and say, God's going to take care of you. And we can look at an 80-year-old man and his wife, and we could, we could go on and on and say, God has taken care of you, and he's still taking care of you, and there's testimonies constantly about it. We can look at a Mr. Coning and say the same thing. And it's just the God that we serve. Amen. It's the God we serve. That we've never seen the righteous forsaken. And he certainly won't start now. May God be your dwelling place in all generations. May God be your dwelling place at every step of life. May it be a point where you stop each season of life and say, Lord, like Moses did, teach me to number my days so that I apply my heart to wisdom. Lord, help me to get wisdom because wisdom is profitable for all. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for simple Bible truths Amen. that we can get wisdom, that we can know our Savior cares, that you've never forsaken us, you won't forsake us in our young or old age. Help us, Lord, that we would be about your business, that we would be seeking first the kingdom of God, I ask that you'd help us tonight, that we would have a wonderful time of enjoyment, of fellowship with the people of God. And we do. We rejoice with the Circes. Lord, maybe we don't make such a big deal out of every time someone turns 80. But Lord, it's you, you're the one who is worth rejoicing in. And we want to take some time tonight and just thank you for those you brought to our church we thank you for each young person that is about their father's business. How many tonight would say, the Lord just spoke to me? I want to ask God regularly, teach me to number my days. That I might apply my heart into wisdom. It doesn't matter how old you are, you can pray that. Lord, may I finish well. Apply my heart to wisdom. Not much further now. I can almost see the other side. Amen. And Lord, I'm looking forward to it. May I apply my heart to wisdom. How many would just say, that's me. I need to pray that. Lord, teach me to number my days, to apply my heart unto wisdom. How many would say, I just want to be about my father's business. The Lord spoke to me about serving, being about my father's business. Father, again, we're so thankful to have such a caring God as you. We know that we are in safe hands, that our, our, our futures are not based on an economy or a Republican or a Democratic-controlled Congress. Our futures 
are securely kept by you. And Lord, may you be our dwelling place in all generations. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. You are dismissed. Yes, I do. First. We're going to have just a few minutes worth of uh, a meeting. If you're able to stay, we'd love for you to stay. We're going to eat in just a few minutes. Before we do, I'm going to take my microphone off and...